All right, so here's a little bit of agenda. So I don't really have any expectations today. And just uh, I want to share general knowledge on graphs. Talk a little bit about why graphs, why they're important. I'm going to give you a little bit of an obligatory background on NoSQL, uh, dev reasons for graphs, some trivial model examples. And this is comp comparing relational to graph just in general. Who's used a relational database? OK. Java users. C sharp. PHP. Put your hands down. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, PHP. I like PHP. Don't get me wrong. There's a great driver for. All right. Ruby. OK. JavaScript or Node or you know thereabouts. OK. Did I leave anybody out? Anybody want to talk about Lisp or Perl? OK. All right. The reason I ask these questions, just give me a little bit of background on you to kind of understand maybe where I might take things a little bit. Um, then we're going to look at uh, actual query code examples. This was initially designed as a uh, four-hour talk, but we only have an hour today. So I'm going to, that's what you love to hear, right? I packed one hour or four hours into one hour. I'm going to spend a lot of time on everything. But I will try to get through everything. The most important thing to me, and there will be a big reveal at the end. Um, I respect your, your time. You, somebody or you paid money to get here, so I'm going to try and respect that. I don't need your complete attention. If you need to take a phone call, take it outside. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I do not have feelings, so you won't hurt them. Don't worry about that. You can try really hard, though. Um, please participate, ask questions. Did I say that already? I think I did. So how, what about me? So I started a company called Graph Story, and basically what we do, and this is the only plug you'll hear, basically what we do is the ops side. We do some dev. We've worked with some Fortune fun, uh, uh, 500 companies. Uh, I wrote this book called Practical Neo for J. I have another one coming out that's on healthcare analytics. Uh, I've been working with graphs, so that's actually not right, uh, for close to nine years now. So um, I don't know why five is there, but I, that the dev part is correct for about 15 years as a dev. OK, so graphs. These are companies that use them, believe it or don't. Facebook is one of the largest public graphs. That we, that we know about. There's these government agencies. They have some graphs that you may not know about. They actually, uh, the British government and the US government have a graph that was one, the graph was written by uh, the Brits. It's called Gaffer. And the data storage engine is written by our NSA, um, which is called Accumulo. So you can guess what that might do. But Facebook is the largest known people graph that's public for the most part. And it recommends friends for you. They built their own graph. They don't use an off-the-shelf piece of software. They built their own thing. Netflix has a content graph that they built. And it's about recommendations. But the other thing that it's about is content development. Um, so there is a British version of a show called House of Cards. Anybody seen House of Cards? OK. Uh, anybody seen the, um, the Kevin Spacey version of that? OK. So they realized that people that watch the British version all the way to the end also watch Kevin Spacey movies all the way to the end. They made this weird connection. And that was evidence to help support, put Kevin Spacey, minus his problems, personal problems, into a, a show that they thought would be successful. And it turned out they were right. Using a graph, that was evidence. The biggest graph in terms of retail is Amazon. I'm gonna get back to them in a minute. But all of their product recommendations are based on this huge connection of data that lives in their proprietary graph. All of these companies have created their own. These companies use one that's off the shelf called Neo4j. So you can see Homeland Security is in that list. So is Marriott. If you ever stayed in a Marriott, you've incidentally used a graph. If you've used Medium, you've incidentally used a graph. There's a bunch out there. And these are some companies that we've supported. So we've worked with Nordstrom and Honeywell on big problems of IoT and retail and using graph. A Bleacher Report, they just started one using, for, who's heard of Bleacher Report? So it's, a, it's kind of like a sports information site. They've used it as part of their social graph. Anybody know what this number represents? That would not be correct. Your hourly rate? That is my hourly rate. <laughs> That's awesome. That would be so cool. I'm done. See y'all. Right. No, it's retail revenue for, for Amazon. 
in two, I looked it up. That's $136 billion. That was three years ago. If you can guess what this number represents, then you've either seen my slides. And how did you see my slides? No. Nope. Any, any other guesses before I move on? No. It's revenue from recommendations at Amazon. 35% of their sales are based on saying this product goes with this product based on whatever you did, whatever you bought, maybe people you know. They know it works. They continue to invest in it. If that's not evidence enough, we'll look at eBay as an example. They had this one hour delivery service. They bought a company. When they started this, it took two minutes to create 2,000 delivery windows, like bring up the delivery options if you're a mom and pop shop. And let's say you're sending something from downtown Jacksonville to not downtown Jacksonville, say a suburb. Um, if you want to go in and look at a delivery option when they have the relational system, it took two minutes for the first window to load. Would you wait two minutes to find that delivery option? No, you would not. Most people wouldn't. It would be a terrible experience. They moved over to a graph, and they have 40,000 delivery windows in two seconds. So they had this algorithm that paired the best delivery services with the route, with the type of package, with the time of day, all of that stuff that they needed to get done. They just couldn't do it in a relational system. They had to move over to a graph. And this is one of their developers. I saw him at this conference called Graph Connect. He said, this, literally thousands of times faster than the relational system. Um, his name is Volker Packer. He ordered a bottle of bourbon using their service at the start of his talk, and at the end of the talk, it was promptly delivered. So, you know, I'm sure that wasn't staged. So, is this a graph? Is this what I'm talking about? Trick, nope, not what I'm talking about. Graphs are about relationships. Purely about relationships. You can thank this old dude for that. It's Leonard Euler. It's, um, it kind of looks like you could pronounce it Euler, but it's, it's Euler, and I've said it wrong before, and people are like, you're not in graphs. Stop talking. What he did was he took this problem. It's called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. Anybody ever heard of this? It comes from graph algebra. He's the father of graph algebra, or the inventor, essentially, of graph algebra. And there are land masses and bridges that he wanted to see if you could traverse and go only once to each land mass and once over a bridge, just one time. Could not do it. So this was the first theory in graph algebra. And I believe it was the Germans that came in later and bombed Konigsberg during World War II. And now you can prove it because they removed some of the bridges with bombs. So there's a little bit better picture there. So you're, you're going on those bridges and touching A, B, C, D. So there's, in graph algebra, essentially these are known as the vertices and the, the lines or edges. That looks a little bit like this when you connect it all together. So just a little bit more context, and then we will start to get into a little bit more meteor stuff. So no SQL does not mean never SQL. It does not mean no to SQL. And when you do it that way, I get like this. Sometimes I get like this. It's adorable. No, not only SQL. So it's complementary. We, we cannot ever get rid of relational databases. They will never go away. And they serve a real purpose. Indexing inside of relational systems where the model is really well known is not going to change. And it fits in relation really well. It's complementary, right? So when you do it this way, I get like this. Just kind of happy. So what's one example of it? Key value store. Amazon's DynamoDB is probably the most popular, most, most used example I can think of. So it's just keys and values, right? It's just two columns, keys, values, or stage left, keys, values, all the way down. Why are those important? Because they're really simple data model. They use them for their e-commerce cart. So you can represent a customer ID with an array that has your shopping cart items in it really fast. Great at scaling horizontally. Challenges with complex and connected data. You may start to sense a theme with these challenges for these NoSQL types. So column family, Cassandra, essentially supported by Facebook. It is a key mapped to a value that is a set of columns. It's a pretty complicated structure, but it's really good at being scalable and no single point of failure. 
uh, supports semi-structured data, which you want. There's a great community behind it, so you can go and use it and essentially be you know, somewhat assured that you're going to get support for it and it's not going to die. Um, connected data, going back to the theme, especially in real time. Great for rear view mirror type of stuff when you're taking a whole bunch of data and now it's static and you want to do big heavy analysis. So anybody use this thing? This is the most popular NoSQL database that's out there. It's a document database called MongoDB. There's others out there. It's a collection of documents with their own key value collection. Simple data model, great at scaling. Uh, Mongo you know, suffered a problem at some point where it might lose your data, things like that, or it had, you know, that's bad, right? We don't want to lose data. But they've figured that out, so that's not a weakness anymore. But connected data, you, you, when you represent a document, you want to change it up a little bit, that's not a problem. When you want to be able to associate those documents, you're going to have to dump that into your code. Now your code represents the schema. That can be a problematic if you, if you need flexibility. So what is a graph? So a graph is essentially a path of a relationship between vertices and their edges, or nodes and relationships, as they're sometimes called. That's usually the most popular way to describe the dots and lines. So this is a node, those are nodes, there's a relationship there, relationship over here. The whole thing forms a path, right? I'm in the center there, I bought a product and I belong to a social group. You know something, there's some, right, there's some integrity, some understanding that you can derive from that relationship. And as you start to kind of build it out a little bit more, you see an industry here where there's a customer and a customer they bought a product, they're in this industry, they're also in this industry, so we we'll probably can recommend this product or service to that customer, right? It's an upsell, cross-sell opportunity. You can do this with the relational system, right? You could create those relationships, but you can't have the variability, you can't have the flexibility. There, you can actually store data on the relationships, like dates or weights, like if you wanted to give a certain relationship a weight, like if they're in an industry, it may have a weight of one. Or if they're connected to a region, like an area, that has a weight of 0.5. You add up all those weights, and then you might have a basic algorithm for doing a recommendation, right? However you want to build that out. So it starts to become kind of this engine that can drive the way data might look in the future or predict what data might do. Because what you're looking at is not just a couple of dots, you're looking at this interconnected network. That is a graph. That's essentially what it looks like inside of the structure, where you have all these dots and lines in the different relationships. That could be Facebook, that could be a retail network, that could be a supply chain, that could be a computer network. And what you're looking for is what you want to pull out of there. What characteristics, what relationships do the red dots have and then the lighter colored dots have, and then the darker shaded green dots. Like, they have distinct paths and patterns, and they reveal something about what's in there. So why use graphs? Well, first of all, it's flexible, super flexible, very change resilient. So has anyone played this game before? <laughs> and the people are laughing like, yes, I have. And one time in production. So yeah, you're going to go in. <laughs> Take your nice, and I've done that too, um, we all have, and if you haven't, you haven't really lived as a developer. Our nice, well-normalized relational system, don't change it, I don't want any more joins in there. We just got this one working, we got our indexes right. No, nope, we're going to change relationships. You know who says that? People not in this room usually. Um, sometimes people in this room. Let's change relationships, let's add some relationships and see what happens, right? We forgot to add a set of keys. Oh, we didn't test it in staging. It worked fine on my machine. Right. Yeah, you can still test it out in staging and it gets to production and something might happen. It, it does happen. Some new join is very slow. It happens, oh my God, stop the upgrade. There's problems we're trying to figure out. I don't know. I, I just like this one for, because that is essentially me and my emotions. What happens next? Panic and hysteria. Remember we had a backup. Gnashing of teeth, weeping, restore the backup, wait, search for the guilty, lost revenue while waiting for the backup, mass firings. <laughs> You're all fired. No. What happens in the graph? No mass firings. No. Uh, you can test everything out in a relational system. It can change. 
but it's just not as flexible. Just not as flexible, is my point. So you can start with this basic relationship, right? You create this in your code. You have an object that is a customer, an object that is a product, and then you run a query and create the relationship. Then you can add an address. You can say this product was shipped to this address, and then the customer viewed this other product, and they returned a product. And then you split up those nodes into different types of address nodes, mailing and billing, because you should do that. Or you don't necessarily have to, you could put a property on it. You can use in Neo4j and most other graphs, a thing called labels. So a node can be described as an address one day, and then you can split them up into two distinct node types called mailing and billing address. And it's very easy to do, unlike in a relational system, which is much more complex. So yeah, this isn't Russia, Danny. Nobody? Okay, that's a Caddyshack reference for y'all that hadn't seen Caddyshack, you should go see Caddyshack, it's in that movie. And if you have to explain the joke, it's not a joke. We drive the model, or we drive the data model, not the other way around, right? You're, if you work with data, you want to be able to push the data, not have the system push back at you. And that's why I like graphs, as opposed to doing relationships inside a rela Relational databases are actually weirdly named because that's not really what they do is relationships. They're, they're storage systems for tables. And then they, you know, at some point, Ed Codd, who developed the first system, was like, maybe we should connect to this table somehow. And that's, they, that was an afterthought. They were actually, Ed, just who, who knows Ed Codd? He was a, I, I, okay, yeah. He was the IBM engineer who came up with the idea of relational systems. They were actually gonna use a graph. The disk size wasn't capable to be able to store graphs, so they had to go with the relational model. You can also answer unexpected questions. This one is really nice, because who in here has ever developed something out, uh, either in a waterfall or an agile method, and it was like the concept behind it was changed enough to where you had to go back and, and redo it. Everybody's hand should go up. Right, businesses change, right? They have new d data needs that they might have. The CMO comes in and says, hey, go look at the data and tell me which customers use the coupon. Chief marketing officer. IT's like, okay, give me a minute. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, it was for this brand. I forgot to tell you, this brand. Okay, give me a few minutes. All right, brand toaster. I forgot, if it, we just want to know about toasters, coupons, brand toaster. Give me 30 minutes. And live in Memphis. Okay, call me tomorrow. And in these zip codes. Okay, call me never. Uh, and purchase after 1 p.m. All right, out. And then, uh, wait, and our ex-cons. Are you trolling me? All right, possible scenario. I know, possibly a little contrived. But graphs are so flexible that those types of questions, when they change, they just depend upon creating new types of relationships. And because you saw from the eBay example, you saw from the Amazon example, they figured out that they can look at world-sized data relationships and be able to have the speed and process and flexibility to be able to change it up so they can change up the algorithm as they kind of need to. And because you can change it, you can answer unexpected questions. So when you get this, you can say, check the dashboard for the most part. And we've done that before. We've gone into companies where they said, we have this big pro data problem. And I said, well, give me some of your data. I'll come back this afternoon and I'll show you an example. And they're like, no, you're not. I'm like, yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Just give me the data. And they did that. And we came back that afternoon. There you go. This, they're like, I mean, how? Because the flexibility in it. Give me another one. And that's essentially how that type of pattern goes. I've, I've worked with relational databases enough to know that this flexibility that you want out of the data is in a graph. So you can also reduce complexity and get faster queries. This is what I like to call join hell. Who's written a join statement in SQL that c contains more than two joins? So you're starting to move towards join hell. Three joins, four joins, five joins, 17 page query. <laughs> I've seen it, I've seen it. I've seen joins, I've seen. There's a company in Memphis, I'm not gonna say who it is, Service Master, and they totally, <laughs> totally have a 17 page query. Yeah, the, non, or the uh, confidentiality uh, agreement ran out like two years ago, so we're good. Or at least that's what I'll say in court. Um, so what, what do you have here? Does anybody wanna read this? Anybody wanna maintain this? No. Okay, yeah, nobody wants to do this. But we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so you're gonna select some stuff from a table called past experience, and we're gonna join it on user ID, then we're gonna join it on cards, then we're gonna go get some coffee because we're tired, 
and then we're going to join it on merchant, and then we're going to join our product, and then we're going to join our ID. And then this is not Service Master example, by the way. This is one that I picked up because it was fairly easy to read, but has five joints in it. So you're doing all this stuff essentially to get some sort of experience based on users, cards, merchant, product, and order. And you want you know, a little bit of information like date of stay, um, in boss name, past experience, whatever. That's not fun. This is the corresponding query inside of Cypher, which is the Neo4j, which is also becoming a standard. They've, they've developed something, Neo4j has opened it so other graph companies can use it. It probably will become the SQL for graphs. Um, cards to past experience, anything that are in the parens there are, are gonna be essentially the nodes. Anything in the square brackets are relationships. And you notice I didn't put in the relationship names because sometimes you don't care about them. You just wanna know that they're connected. So you see a dash, square bracket, dash, that's how they're related to each other. Those are your joins. And you start it with the join process at the top. So match this pattern and then return this data. That is a very basic. So which one do you want? Do you want you know, 10 lines here or do you want the two lines here? You want the two lines, stop. Each join requires a table or an index scan. If, has anybody had to update an index inside a relational system after you had, say, 10 million records in it? It is not fun. It can be done, not fun. So, yeah, 10 million records. What if your scan is over 10 million records? What if it's over 100 million or a billion? Easily to get into that with some uh, company's data to get into a billion records. You're in deep relational pain. You got more joins, slow queries, more data, slower queries, more data plus more joins, phone calls because of painfully slow queries. It happens. All right, so now we're going to transition, we're good on time, into some basic graph models. This should start to give you a bit of a foundation so that everybody kind of raise their hand on the relational side. So sh you sh when you see the relational examples, you should, should know what I'm talking about. When you see kind of the graph model, it'll give you the one for one, hopefully. And we'll cover some basic ones here. Social, so you can go out and do this on your own. Interest, consumption, and then intent. So that's prediction, that's modeling out to show what likely would happen based on the data we know about. So this is a relational model where you have a user over here, they have an ID user, a name, a password that you're hashing, no clear text passwords. Friends, user ID, friend ID, status, right? Like, whatever, whatever the relationship is. That's how it would work. This is the mutual style connection. So like when you connect with somebody on Facebook, they all are mutually connected. On Twitter, you know, it's a one-way type of connection. And that looks like this in a graph. This person is connected to this person. They are friends. Greg and Kenny are friends. And you use a directional relationship in this case, right? I friended Kenny. But the relationship can go both ways, right? You don't necessarily, because it's a pointed directional relationship, it still represents a relationship back the other way. If you want to get explicit, so this is this Twitter style in a relational system, you have a follower ID and a followed ID, and you have a separate table. Sometimes this is called like a join table, where you're just putting in relationships. It's like an extra thing that you have to create just because you want some relationships. Why do they call this a relational database? I have no idea. Here is what you would do in an explicit sense for Twitter. You'd have a direction, now this directional relationship means something. Because I could follow Kenny, but he doesn't necessarily have to follow me. And that is a, follows is the name of the relationship. That will go in the query. That is essentially like a table name that you'd put in, or a property. And those relationships can have their own properties. So we start a little bit more complex. We have this join table in the middle now. So we have interest over here. We have a user over here, and right in the middle is your user interest. And I've done this before when I had a thing called um, CrowdPlace. It was like Slack. This was 2011, so I created Slack, is what I'm saying. This is 2011, we had the concept of channels. You could go into a channel, chat with people in the channel, and you connect with them based on interest, or we'd make recommendations. Once we got up to 50,000 users, doing stuff like this was really hard with the relational system. Even a beefy MySQL box was hard. This is when I found graphs, and found them to work a lot better. That's it, that's it for, look, look at the models. This one, or this one. You have a person connected to an interest, that's it. You can see in the middle there where I start to put 
properties on the relationship. How many times they looked at something with Neo4j and when it was created, when that connection was created. Consumption. So this is when you go and look at a product or you look at a piece of content. So in a relational system, you'll have a product table and a content table and there's a user product view and there's a user content. So you're created two extra tables to be able to connect to two different things. When the business looks at this, they love it, right? They're just like, oh yeah, no, I don't understand it. When marketing looks at that, they'll get that, right? We have a, pro it's, it's whiteboard conducive. When you draw this out to the business, they get this. They're, they're maybe. I'm tired. Um, oh my God, now they're going to sleep. What is this? This is a product recommendation or a friend recommendation. You have products, you have a product tag, tags are, products are tagged, you have a user who's interested and they have a tag and that goes back to that product tag and somehow they're tied together and then users follow users and they have an address so they live somewhere or at least they said they do. And then they'll have orders with orders and products and it's, it's there, that's the, you just business, trust me, this is it. This is the graph version of that. You, it's, you know, still there's some complexity here, but you can follow it. A person has interests. A product could also be connected to an interest. A product has this thing tied to it. There's a product called Neo4j. I'm interested in Neo4j. I have friends who made an order where they purchased, and that purchase contains Neo4j, and I live at a location. It's, that is essentially from a modeling standpoint. When you start to get complex relationships, this is, to me, the way to go. So Greg, are graphs always the best solution? You feel like there's a trap, right? Yeah, it's a trap. Plot twist, graphs may not be the best solution. May not make sense. Sometimes things just don't make sense. Let's take a minute here to look at what the heck's going on. I understand, I guess, the UPS truck and why they're talking. I can even get guy in tuxedo, but this I don't. I don't know what's going on there. I don't want to know, really. But sometimes things don't make sense, right? Prioritize results over technology. Uh, I talked to somebody who works at a top 10 um, accounting firm, and they called me last week and said, we want to start a graph project. And I said, really? Oh, so what, have you done a proof of concept? No. So what's your, what's your reasoning behind it? Well, we just want to use a graph. That's not why you use technology. We had, we and I taught people out of it a lot. Don't use a graph unless you need a graph. Find your use case. Start with questions. This is the way that I like to do. So think about how something could be used best as a relational and a graph. It's like when you see this picture, besides thinking about you know, the beer you'd like to drink right now because my talk's so boring, um, what do you think about from a relational perspective? What could you ask here? Or what might be asked by the people on the other side of the bar? That's one. That's good. So to gain interest into this place and have a drink, you have to have a certain characteristic about you. You have to be 21. So the average age, that's great for relational. Relational is awesome at aggregate. Graph is getting better at aggregate data. But relational is really good at getting average age, right? Average age of the patrons. But for a graph, who will most likely buy me a beer? Right? That's what I want to know. So you think about that picture. There's other things that you could, when you talk about the flavors, there could be a connection to you and the particular brand that you like, right? You could learn lots of things about relationships there. But you want to make sure you're using the right technology and applying it the right way. All right, finally, the thing you came here for, to get confused by Cypher examples. So this is Cypher. I showed you a little bit earlier. This is going to be a more basic version of it. So whenever you write Cypher, you want to be able to return it back to some data or, or programming language and ultimately surface it somewhere else. So there's some Cypher that is integrated in, into systems, like C Sharp has a great Cypher library. Like there's, you don't have to write as much Cypher, but you can totally straight up write Cypher. Python has a, like a graph 
um, kind of connection model where they'll, you know, like mapping. Java does too, like a mapping type of thing. So you don't have to write out all the object code and build that up. Um, but a lot of times you will find that Cypher is going to be faster than those types of modeling or mapping tools. Just like you, I think, uh, you know, like the Spring, li who's used the Spring library in here? So essentially, yeah, it's a way to kind of abstract away things. You can totally use that. But I recommend starting with the queries. And before you jump to the queries, when you're trying to figure out what it is you're trying to figure out from the data, think about a question that you have. Think about it from the real world view. So here, what we're trying to do is match content based to a tag, right? This content has this tag is what we're, what we're doing here. The other thing that I kind of like about this, besides the fact that it looks kind of like ASCII art, is that it reads like a sentence. Content has tag. That's pretty, I mean, for the most part, you know, to me, it's a little bit easier to read than SQL. So this is a variable, sorry, this is a variable that you can return. You see the bottom statement there that actually contains the data. You can return relationship, and there's the label. There's the relationship, and it has a direction. Sometimes that's important in a query, sometimes not. If you want to make sure it has that direction, yeah. How do you pare it down, like limit it? Um, so when you're filtering it, like in this case, the filter we're using is a property called name. So if you wanted tags that have cheese or cats. So then you can do paging. So you can, there's like a limit and a skip that we'll show in just a second here. So there's the property and the parameter that we're gonna look up. The property is name and we're passing in a parameter that's called n. And those are the variables we're gonna return. We're gonna return content, tag, and the relationship. Because that might be important. Here's how you create an index. So in most graph cases, they'll have an index. Like Neo4j uses Lucene. Anybody heard of Lucene? It's an Apache project under the hood. Elasticsearch under the hood is Lucene. So you, can, you get the best of kind of both worlds there. You get fast lookups. So you want to create indexes anytime that you're going to do things like this, where you're gonna filter on something. If you're gonna look up on that name, create an index. You can drop an index, essentially kind of reverse, just drop index. You can also create constraints, so you want unique values. This is a good time to mention there are no primary keys necessarily. Like there's the equivalence of like a row ID but you'd never use a row ID in a relational system because it's volatile, right? You may delete a row and then the other thing becomes that row. There is a ID on nodes and an ID on relationships. You can do lookups on them, they're not that fast. So what I recommend that you do is you create your own key, like a UUID or something like that. There's also plugins for most graph systems where you take a piece of code and you drop it into the library of the, of the system and it will automatically create IDs for you that you can use for, you know, for uniqueness. But this is how you do constraints on particular properties. So I wanna make sure username is unique, you create that constraint. Same thing for dropping a constraint. I wish there were more jokes in this section, but they're not. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna start doing a little comp uh, comparison here. This is fun. Select star, because you always select star, right? We don't care what we're getting back. We just want everything back. Uh, from user where username equals Greg. There was one joke in there, it was awesome. Um, this is what it would look like in Cypher world. This time I didn't select star, but you could. Essentially selecting star would be just like return you. But I got specific and said I want to just full name, email, and username. So that is kind of a one to one from select in SQL world and Cypher world. You can match on a label. This returns all users. If you ran this on Facebook, you'd break Facebook, right? Because you're returning every single user. So limits and skips are gonna help here. Yep, do you have a question? Right. You can do a count on relationships. So 
uh, we'll, I'll show you an example in just a minute, but yeah, you can do that. You can also put value into a relationship, like, like a relation, and, and store that as you kind of move forward, so you can actually query it out, you know, as a property or something like that. So this is a match using a label and property and specifying a directional type, or, or without specifying a directional type, that should say. I'm just saying where there's a user whose username is Greg, whatever, whatever relationships they have, I don't care what they are, friend, follows, whatever, just connected to anything. So this is Greg connected to anything in the graph, all of his relationships, and return both of them. So you'd have one node over here if, there's, if username is unique, called Greg, and B could be is a list of whatever's in the graph. So you, it could be products, addresses, everything that's connected to Greg in some way. Using a label on a property and a label on the other node, but no specific relationship. Okay, so here we're saying Greg connected to any user. So who am I connected to in this graph? Return me and them. And there's a joke about a band in there. Nobody? You too. Okay. All right. Ma match user to user ID 1. And I just want these relationships. So I can specify, I'm going to give this side of the room some love. I can specify current or favorite in a direction to whatever. So, so user ID 1, I switched up the properties a little bit here. Only the relationships called current or favorite connected to whatever. We had fun. <laughs> All right, optional match. This is important. Sometimes relationships don't exist, but you want to test for them anyways and return them if they do. So I definitely know, or at least I have an idea, that there's a user named Greg because that's what he put in when he logged in and I've stored it as a cookie or whatever. Does he follow anybody or is he a lonely SOB? Nobody? Was it the cursing? All right, so here's an optional match where I say, Tell me if Greg follows anybody, and I don't. Oh no, thank you. So yeah, in this case, we want to return Greg and anybody he might be connected to. This is important because if, you, if there are no relationships, it's going to return a null value. So you want to be able to uh, specify that out. And also, if you search on a match, it's not as optimal if you are unsure that the relationship exists. So if there's some variability in it, you want to use the optional match. Here I'm just returning all nodes found for Greg. And this is an alias doing the same thing. So I want to send back first name. So you may have something in your code where you want to do that, or you have some other good reason why you want an alias. But just showing you that, just like you can in SQL, you can do that. Yep. Yes. Like an anti-pattern? Well, well, yeah, well, like your optional for, for the Greg where he doesn't have any connections. Yes. Can you find all of the currently SOBs? Yes, you can totally do that where they don't have relationships. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You can totally do that. And we're, and we're going to get to that. So this is Greg, and I want a relationship. I don't care what it is, but I'm going to call it R. So return any relationship. And I'm going to use the, uh, the, the variable R to return it. And I don't care what it's connected to. But the reason I excluded anything here, if I wanted to return some value, I'd put something there and then put it in the return statement. If you add that there, the database is going to go get it. So as you can imagine, it's basically, it has to do all of that lookup. If you don't need that data, if you just want the relationships, then leave it empty. Don't return anything because it has to process it. So here's what I'm going to say where equals true. So in the match statements earlier where I was specifying tag or some that has some property or username equals Greg, you can use a where statement. Matches typically are with a, on a property or the way to go, but there's sometimes there's a good reason why you might use a where statement instead. And sometimes it has to do with performance. Sometimes it has to do with readability. Sometimes it has to do if you're doing multiple types of conditions. So where active equals true and you know name is Greg. You can also do match on user name is Greg, where u equal or u dot active equals true. So you can kind of mix and match. Can I get the list of uh, all the properties for that user? Like similar to DAs, so I might like describe 
Yes. So you can, um, there's a command statement called uh, schema. So it'll show you what, what characteristics they have. And hopefully we're going to have time. I think we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, we'll look at, like, take five minutes and we'll, you know, tempt the demo gods. And I'm going to do kind of a live gulp demo. All right. So you can do regex matches too. Anybody that's, whose name, username starts with GRE, whatever. You can do lowercase, uppercase types of stuff there too. There it is, case insensitive. And this is where you can do like a property match on an array of values. So this is an example where the where statement actually does come into play. Where username in array of values. So your example earlier, username Greg, where not follows you. This represents who I'm not following. So here's my list of followers, list of not followers. So it's kind of an example where you're returning the, the pattern. And here's where you'd probably want to do another limit type of thing. You don't want to return everybody I'm not following because there's a lot of people. So this starts to get into the skip limit thing we referred to earlier. Um, based on what I've seen up to this, or shared up to this point, anybody know what this might represent? You're fired. No, it's OK, of course, but seriously, you're fired. Um, so yeah, anybody, any guesses what this might represent? I know what that P represents. Yes, another joke in there that got it made its way in. I don't know how that happened. Um, that's Facebook. That's Facebook. <laughs> that is Facebook right there. Where username is whatever, username is you, follows, and I added something here that is kind of helpful. I just want the first stage of relationships, that connection out to one. And it's not called degrees. Degrees are the number of relationships in math. It is not like the steps out, like seven degrees or six degrees of Kevin Bacon is not talking about six steps away. That's in represents the number of relationships, so they got it wrong. They don't know their maths. Follows to one stage out to F. So that's only my first set of relationships out where I follow this person, not people that I follow who follow others. Make it distinct. Because I want to make sure if there's any, you know, somehow a du dual relationship got added in. No, I'm going to make it distinct on a person. So then I'm going to match. F, which is the people that I follow, their current LP, and their next SU. Return SU, F username, as username, F equals U as owner, order by timestamp. This match here on the third line, that's their last post. That's LP. So it's a linked list. So you can imagine like a dot up here and a line down to a dot here, and a line down to a dot here, and it goes all the way down. That's their linked list, but I'm doing it on multiple users, anybody that I follow. And then from there, I'm gonna return their status updates and their username, and F equals U is whether they own that piece of content or not. So that tells you whether it can be edited by who's making the request. If they're my, because I'm gonna have my updates in that list too, I wanna know if I can edit them or not. Or if they're yours, I shouldn't be able to edit them. And then I'm going to order them by timestamp. So the most current post down to as you scroll through. And then I can do a skip and limit. So start at zero and limit to 10. So it's 10 of everybody that I follow, including my posts, mixed and only uh, bring 10 back based on date. This is how Facebook would work if you wrote it in neo 4 j So how do we create things? This is an insert statement. This is a create statement. They use the word create, which I like. I just created a user with a username Greg just doing that. You can put anything you want in there that labeled user, capital U, could be whatever. This is how you update in SQL. This is how you update in Cypher. So I'm going to use set just like you would in SQL. It's kind of Find the user, then I have a, a variable called u, set full name equal to Greg Jordan. 
you don't necessarily have to return. Return means you're going to send that information back. If you're not going to use it, don't push it across the wire or over the air. This is doing a multiple value set. So find user Greg and then put active and his business property is called graph story. See the plus symbol there equals. Same thing here. Question. Besides putting the property and the value in, yeah, that's, that's basically how you'd run it. Yeah. So it, th in this instance here, those values didn't necessarily exist. I may have just, you know, this is the first user that gets them. And you could, you could go in if you wanted to and do match user, leave out that qualifier of username equals Greg and then set true, so you could set every single user in the graph to active equals true. That's the way to, if you wanted to all, give them all the business graph store, you could do that as well. I don't know why you would. But that's, that's essentially adding that property on the fly, is how it would work. Another way that you could do it, I think this is the kind of closer to the example that you were talking about, where you just have a comma separated list of keys and values. You can also put different labels on a user or whatever. So I go and get a user with username Greg. I'm going to set this particular um, pro or, uh, node to also have the labels of writer and developer. So you can describe the nodes in multiple ways. So you can get very specific with the labels. But be careful here because you need to make sure that those don't work better as characteristics as properties rather than labels because you start to get this graph where you come up with you know every single type of label that you can get start small start small and then expand out when the, there's a definite business case to add in a label as part of your query like you're looking at it and saying the query would make, you know make more sense if it was described as a label and not as a property of a node so Label exists to denote something that is part of the schema, like as a, as a high order element of the schema, whereas a property is just a characteristic inside of or one of the. Looking at the proof, for example. What's that? Looking at the proof, for example, one, 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 one. So I'm, I'm calling this variable as a label here, and I'm saying for this label called user, call, also add writer and developer. So now, this particular node is now has the label user, writer, and developer because the sequence, what's that? Yes. You, now, if you, if you wanted to go back and change, like if you added writer and developer there, you could go back here and say match you developer, where username equals Greg and set full name to Greg Jordan. Or writer, whatever labels you, just be careful with labels because they, they do add complexity, but they can also impact performance if you're not, if you're not using it right. It, and it's one of those things where it's not like there's no cut and dry rule to it. But if you have a business case for it, that, that does kind of help in the instance. Yes? Um, you said, you know, you do that if you kind of like split these things up. But physically, like, something is certain, uh, it's still physically one, one uh, Right, so. So like an index on, on username is, gonna, is going to stay as an index on username. It's going to be connected back to user. User and developer and writer are essentially going to be like, like pointers inside the structure. Basically aliases. Yeah, something like that, like aliases, almost like aliases, but not quite. So this is how you delete. Delete from user where username equals reg. That's SQL. So you do kind of the same thing you're going to match. Careful here, because if you do match on user you and not have thing, you delete all the users. Don't do that, unless you want to. Then you're fired. All right. Um, match username. This is important. You don't want to leave orphans out there. You have a node that's not connected to anything. What is the point of it? Just use a document store. So I'm going to find Greg and all of his relationships, and then I'm going to delete the relationships first, and then Greg. Bye, Greg. What? Um, no. So, uh, if you were to delete the user, the associated labels, are they still there or do they get removed as well? 
Labels are still there as long as one node exists with that label. Okay, so yeah. So the yeah. You're deleting that single node. Yeah. So imagine your graph, you have, you know, 100 users into it. Greg is one of them. You delete him, those 99 still exist as users. Oh, no, I mean, like, for uh, Greg is associated with developer, writer, and all that. Yes. Yeah, so all, all, yeah, all of that goes away, too, as kind of an ancillary benefit. Yep. So it won't mess with any of other people's data and their similar relations? Nope. They, it, you're, you're, you're basically removing anything that's connected to Greg. It's like that's it. Similar to the cascading delete, similar. So here's how we would remove a particular property. So we're not going to use email anymore, so we're going to remove it. No more email for anybody. No, just for Greg. So he don't have email address anymore. This is how we remove a label. So we're going to go get this thing and say, on U1, remove the label user. Just for Greg, though. He's not a user anymore. Okay, we're getting close to the demo time, but I, one last thing I'm going to cover. I know this is a lot, and I know this, hopefully you'll take this away and want to go download Neo4j and start playing with it. Um, I can send out uh, examples to you. Um, I'll share my email address. I think I have it at the end. If not, come up and see me. Um, so there's two ways to get data in, and most of the graph systems use this type of thing. There's a batch import tool. So this is when you have a set of data that's static that you're going to move over into Neo4j one time. We have a customer where every night we take everything inside of a SQL system that is the true source of the truth and we move it out of SQL Server into a CSV set that gets imported using this batch tool. It takes like uh, about 500 million records and creates a brand new graph every night in about 10 minutes using this batch tool. So you got to stop the graph Almost all graph systems are like this way. You have to stop the graph to be able to load the data in. So there is some downtime that you, and it, but it rebuilds the whole thing. So if, you're, if, you're, if your initial data set is ready to go, this is the tool to use. If you want to rebuild the graph every night, which you do not recommend, and the reason we're doing it is because in the other system, there's not a good way to determine what has changed. So we have to move the, the whole thing over. But you can do it. The other way is to use load CSV, and this is when you're just dealing with like a sample set of data where you know, it might be millions of records, but not like hundreds of millions or tens of millions, where you just maybe have some sample data. Load CSV is, uh, is specific to Cypher. Essentially, you're saying you can say load CSV from a file that sits on the same system where the database resides, or you can also use HTTPS to go out to the web somewhere and download a CSV. Again, it's thousands of records. Okay, I think we have just a few more minutes here. Load CSV, do we just stop the data? Load CSV, do not. There's a third way, of course, which is you construct your own streaming, own set of code that you, you know, push data into. Thank you. Um, I love when that happens. But load CSV, how does it recreate the old cycle? Like, when you load the new data? Yes, yes, yeah, it's, it's, that's exactly right. So, this is where I give you some code. You add to it. And now we're buddies. Y'all didn't expect that, did you? OK. So here is what's called the Neo4j browser. You can see over there, there are node labels. So hopefully this will kind of crystallize something. Here's the count of the total number of nodes that are comprised in all of these labels. Here's the count of the total number of relationships that are in these labels. And what I've done is created kind of an application that does loading of categories and products and purchases and reviews and status. So it's like if you had Facebook and Amazon and uh, Yelp had a baby, that'd be all the stuff that it'd have in it. In fact, that's where most of this data comes from is, well, Amazon and Yelp opened some of their data, which I've used, and then uh, just made up users and stole data from Facebook. <laughs> I didn't steal data from Facebook, but you, you totally can. Um, all right, so if I just click on a category here, sir, whoa, what just happened? Sir, with Cambridge Analytics. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you see here, I said, I just clicked on it and it said, match on category and return in and limit by 25. And it does this cool thing where it shows you all the relationships out 
you have a subject of books and this is the parent caddy. So this is that linked list that I was talking about earlier. And let's see if command minus or plus. Nope, worse. Even worser. Yeah. Yeah. So you see this linked list here that gives you an example. That's essentially what the status would look like. And here's one where clergy, this is uh, categories from Amazon, by the way. Reference materials, comments. For some reason, it got some, <laughs> it got religion on us. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant to do in a presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not here to push any agendas. Um, I promise, I promise. But I am going to have a talk later on that. So. <laughs> right. To each their own. Um, yeah, those are categories. Let's get rid of that. Let's look at purchases. Okay, so this one didn't have explicit relationships that it was going to return. But I can click on this and do that, and it'll show you all the relationships. So Neo4j has created this handy dandy tool that shows you, that can show you relationships and give you a little bit of guidance here and you can start to like kind of spread it out and see all the relationships. This is where you'd run that load CSV statement. You can run Cypher commands directly from here and it is very easy to do. This is about as hard as this is. So you're gonna put, you're gonna download Neo4j and it works essentially the same way. You need Java, that's what the J stands for. This Neo4j also has a lot of matrix references. So just deal with it. If, if you're not a fan, I'm very sorry, but that's the way they, they, they did it. Um, you just unpack a file system onto your machine and you're gonna go in and do, go to the bin folder and do Neo4j start. And there's gonna be a short delay after you Start that up, and then essentially what you'll get, you see it's connecting, just the connection was lost. And then you'll go to localhost 7474, and you can start to run queries right away. All of those Cypher examples you could run. I also have a ton of data that I can make available to you. I have, yes, PHP examples, Java examples, Spr Spring examples, C Sharp examples, Python, Ruby. I actually wrote a client or helped write a client for iOS in Swift. You can do that too if you want. Um, most of the code examples are connected to some library that's specific to the graph, to what graph you're using. We also have experience with Janus, which is another graph. It's um, sponsored by a bunch of different, it essentially was a thing called Titan that they turned into another graph that uses a Greek god name. Um, but it's open source and free, and it's just as fast as Neo4j. Does anybody know how much Neo4j costs? Somebody asked me how much Neo4j costs. Is it, is it, there's a community version that is free, but there's an enterprise edition, if, and I recommend to do that if you're gonna run it in a production sense, because if you need to back up the data in community, you gotta turn the database off, which is awesome, right? There's no data coming in, we just turn it off. No, don't use community, only use community for projects where you're trying things out, it's totally free. You could do an image, yeah, there's, uh, there's ways to get around it, but I think that it violates the license, so you didn't hear that from me. Um, the enterprise version for a production cluster, everybody's like, what, what is it? $100,000. That's why, that's right. That's what I said, $100,000 to get started. Janus Graph is free, totally free. Neptune, not so much. Neptune and Janus Graph share, share this, similar query language called Gremlin. It's like, looks like dot notation. And it also has its own weird set of names that go along with that. And there is a bridge for the Cypher language to use on Neptune. So you put this plugin in, I mentioned plugins earlier. Sorry, I don't have time to go into the details on that. But, so I'm at greg.jordan at graphstory.com or gmjordan on Twitter. Uh, if you have questions, I'm probably gonna hang around for a few minutes. Um, any other questions before we wrap up that you'd like to share with the group? All right, y'all have been super awesome. I really appreciate y'all coming out. Yeah, it was louder in here. <laughs>